looking outside the window and the sun is coming up. It's half past three in Finland and it was it was dark for like two hours and now the sun is coming back up and that's the the big benefit of living in Finland, the summers. The the nights are bright and, and long. Uh yeah. All right, so we are um, we're always open for for speakers. So if you would like to speak at this meetup, um, we would love to host you, regardless of your level of speaking or regardless of your level of programming. Um, any level across both. And if you want to get help, like creating a talk, uh, just reach out to me on any of the uh, the socials um, or just on Meetup itself, and uh, and we'll be good. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we're live streaming this to Twitch. I'm also going to post an archive of this to YouTube and I'll put a uh, link to the video in uh, the meetup page afterwards. So in case you want to like rewatch through, I've already gotten a question, uh, Juhis, about uh, uh, slides. So if if you do have them, are you going to make them available? Yes, I will share them on the chat on the meetup page. You can also then share them on Twitch at the end of the talk, but they, they will be available. Awesome. Well, without further ado, because you didn't come here to uh, listen to me talk all night, um, uh, uh, let me introduce you to uh, Juhis. Uh, he's a developer community builder, who a web developer and programming teacher from Helsinki, Finland, uh, where it is 3 a.m. Um, when he's on a computer, he works on all parts of the stack from the back end to the front end. When he's not on a computer, he's passionate about making tech a welcoming industry for everyone. Take it away, Juhis. Thanks, Brooks. And once again, the, the classic, can you see my slides? Yes, yes sir. good. Awesome. So I'm here to talk about learning Rust. And it was super nice to hear before we, we went live that we have all sorts of people joining the event. Some who have recently started learning, some who have been working with Rust for a while. And I hope that for those of you who are just starting with Rust, I hope to give kind of hope and kind of like the peer experience of the things that I've struggled with, but also the things that I've enjoyed. And if you're a more experienced developer and more experienced Rustasian, I hope that this will give you new insights as well into maybe you're mentoring juniors in your team, maybe you're writing documentation for libraries. I think it's always good to get some ideas from people new to the new to the language, new to the ecosystem. And maybe most importantly, I'm gonna talk about things that I find difficult or things that I don't enjoy that much. But it is not to say that I wish those things would be different in Rust. So this talk is by no means going to be kind of a negative talk about Rust. It's just the things that I've experienced and I try to, to kind of be as open as possible about those things. Couple of words about myself. Like Brooks mentioned, I'm joining from Helsinki, Finland. The sun is, is rising up. It's half past three in the morning. And sorry, I've never been to Denver. I used to live in San Francisco. But if there are any hockey fans, from the Colorado area. I was really rooting for the Colorado Avalanche. Mikko Rantanen, who's from the same town as I am, was this is playing in, in the Avalanche and I've been a big fan of them for quite a while. During the day, I'm a developer advocate at a European company called Futuris. We're a software and, and design consultancy. And during night, like right now, I also build developer communities. I run a meetup like this one for front-end developers. And I run a couple of other communities. I have a YouTube 
YouTube show, I tweet, I blog, I try to provide a lot of content, especially helping people learn about technology, software development, and so on. So a little bit of my background. I've been coding for the past like 15, 20 years, but I've mostly been working with Python and JavaScript. And compared to those, Rust is quite a different language. Like the, the things that I really like about Python and JavaScript is the kind of ease of use, the developer experience, the, the fact that they are interpreted languages, they are quite straightforward, dynamically typed. Those are all things that I really, really enjoy in a programming language. So when I jumped to Rust, I've had to learn a lot of new things. But it's been, it's been a good experience. And it's been definitely an eye-opening experience. And I'm a strong believer that we always should kind of expand beyond the day-to-day -day technologies that we use. I think that we can learn a lot from learning different languages. So, oops, sorry. So originally, I learned about Rust a couple of years ago. It was kind of popping on the radar. There were some people interested in it. But I didn't pay a lot of attention until Python Estonia in 2019. I was doing a talk about different topic, and I met Dom, who was doing a talk about Rust with Python. And that talk kind of got me excited about Rust. Dom is a fantastic speaker. You can you can find the talk from the slides. And since I was using Python a lot. I figured this would be a nice way to also get started with, with Rust myself. And this was October of 2019. And then it took a while. I didn't start learning Rust immediately. I didn't jump right into the language and start building things. As a software developer and community builder, there's a lot happening, a lot of things to build, events to participate, talks to give. And then there was the pandemic. So Rust was kind of set aside, waiting for a better moment. And that moment was December of 2020, a little bit over 12 months after the, the PyCon. And I started with Advent of Code, which is this Advent calendar every year where you get some puzzles every day and you need to solve them by writing some code. And I've always used that. 
So then, a little bit later, in January of 2021, I decided to start to build a real tool. Instead of just focusing on solving like programming puzzles, I figured that I would get the best experience by actually building something that I would use myself and something that other people would use day to day. And like I mentioned, I'm a big NHL fan. So I decided to build a tool that gives me the NHL results on the command line. And because of the time zones, I usually check them in the morning because the games are played in the middle of the night. And that app is called 235 and you can find it on grades or as a binary from GitHub. And you can see on the screen what the output of that looks like. It's, it ended up being a really good project because the scope was quite small. The, the design was simple and kind of fixed, but it was still a real life project that I've been using every day for the past six, six and a half months. Which brings me to a couple of things that I want to share today. Some of these things are things that I really like about Rust. And some of the are things that I, I struggle with, things that I don't like so much, and things that I, I hope to learn to become better with as time goes on. And this is something I already mentioned before the talk, that pattern matching is something I absolutely love. It's my by far the favorite feature in, in Rust. Uh, for those who are not familiar, this is what pattern matching looks like. It's kind of a, an evolved if-else clause where you match some variable into different like arms of the pattern matching. So in this case, when I print the print the, the individual lines, it's possible that both of the teams have scored. It's possible that only the, the home team has scored or that only the away team has scored. And the reason I like this so much is that it is so elegant. It is so beautiful. And to me, it is super intuitive. Like I I've been using it too much. I know that there's some pieces of code in my code base that could be an if, if else clause. But since I'm learning new things, I've been using match and pattern matching for a lot of things. And one of the things that that it kind of matches really nicely is with the option at the result type of cross language where you, you kind of don't have to check if something is, is null in other languages. Have you? you never have to worry about those cases because the pattern matching forces you to be exhaustive. You need to go through all the different cases that are possible. And when used in a kind of concise manner, I think it's, it's a really nice, easy to read, easy to follow. It takes a bit to learn if you're new to it. But I think that once you learn it, it becomes a really nice and elegant piece of, of writing code. And one thing I'm super excited about is that it's coming to Python in Python 3.10, which comes out in October this year, we are getting pattern matching as well. It's a little bit different from Rust because of the like lack of, of like strong typing or like a static typing and certain structures that the typing system of, of Rust gives. But it's, it's, I think it's a step to the better direction. I've been kicking 
if it's clear from, let's say, a function call, what the end result is. But one place where it really kind of bothers me, and this is something where I want to emphasize that I do understand the value of strong static typing. I'm just not a fan of it as a developer when I'm, I'm typing the code. And the thing that I don't like in particular is when you nest different types and when you build like custom types. Let's look at an example from my, my project. So this is what my code looks like. I'm doing some deserialization of, of JSON. And there's a lot of these like nested JSON properties where I need to give names to all of the different objects or constructs or whatever you want to call them, the types. So in this case, for example, on line three, you can see that the date is type of date response. And then that has a couple of variables or properties that have their own types. And it's, that's, that's something that I feel that I have to write so much. I can give names to everything, even when I don't need the names. I've been writing a bit of TypeScript lately, and one of the cool things you can do with TypeScript is you can basically do something like this, or now the date is basically just an anonymous struct. And I've been reading a bit about the discussion in the Rust community about anonymous structs. And there seems to be quite a divide on whether they should exist or not and how feasible they are. So I'm not gonna kind of take any sides in that battle. I'm, I'm not like, I don't have a strong opinion when it comes to the Rust itself. But this is something that I, like, I often feel that is a little bit kind of annoying, a little bit extraneous to write when I, I, I just want to say that, okay, this one thing is a struct. I don't need to give it a name, but then Rust makes me do that. It's in the end, it's a small thing, but it's one of those things I escaped from Java into Python and, and JavaScript a decade ago, because with, with those languages, I can just type things and, and they are dynamically typed. The second thing that I, I've become a fan of, and this is something I haven't used that much because I've been building just a command line tool, like a, a binary that gets run rather than libraries, but I'm a big fan of, of the design of Rust Dog and documentation tests. I've been doing a bunch of talks about the importance of documentation. And documentation is something really close to my heart. It's something that I I think we undervalue in, in the industry. And we should be doing more. And the thing I love about it in Rust is that it it brings it really close to the code, but it also makes it kind of programmatic in a way. Let's take a look at an example. So this is a modified example from the Rust Dog book or Rust by example, either one of those, both really good resources. But here we have an implementation of a struct and with these triple forward slashes, we define the Rust doc, the documentation that we can generate. We can add markdown, we can add examples with code blocks. And this is something you can do with pretty much any language. But what makes this really cool is that the code blocks are actually runnable. So you can guarantee 
to go to leaves. And then the second thing that I, I don't, I don't like, maybe it's the right, or maybe that I'm not good enough with yet, that I struggle with. And this is something I knew when I got into Rust. Back in university, I did a class on, on C and C++. And these are the same kind of things that I struggled with. As a Python and JavaScript developer, I can just pass variables to functions and then it never complains to me. But with Rust, there's so many things that, whether it's about ownership, borrowing something, the lifetime of variables, passing by reference, these are all things that I, I constantly trip when I'm doing things. And the weird thing is that when I read about them, I feel like I understand. But when I open the, the code editor and I start writing the code, I'm in, in trouble all the time. I recently participated in a Rust Lab meetup a couple of weeks ago where Neil Shamrell Harrington gave a great talk about the, the borrow checker that gives you, it helps you figure out if you're making mistakes with, with those things. And while I was watching it, I was nodding along. I was like, yes, makes total sense. But for some reason, I'm not still comfortable enough. I'm kind of, I don't have the routine of dealing with these things. That whenever I make some bug fixes or new features, there's always a couple of things that that I trip to. So here's one example of, of one of my advent of code codes that I, I kind of recreated the bug for this presentation. And I tried to pass a vector to two different functions. And the compiler started complaining that you cannot do that. You've, you've moved the value, which is something that in Python and JavaScript, I, I, I don't do. That's not a concept. So there's been a lot to learn. But I think it was, I think it was Brooks or somebody else who mentioned before the talk that the, the compiler is actually quite nice with Rust. And in December, I wrote this quote in my, my blog post that like the compiler, the way it's written, is so nice that when you're in a stressful situation where the code doesn't work, it's, it's kind and it, it helps you, not just telling that you're wrong, but it's telling you how to fix things. And I think that that is, that is something I, I do like about Rust once again. It has one of the best compiler messages and errors that I've, I've ever seen. Helm is another language that I like because of its, its errors. They are written by humans to humans, not to computers, but to other people. And they're kind of, hey, it's okay. You made a mistake. Let's fix it. It's not the end of the world. And I think that that sentimentality really helps especially at the beginning and especially during stressful things. And then the third thing that I struggle with, and I, I, I even struggle to, to write about this or, or kind of how to phrase this, because it's difficult for me to come up with examples. So I'll try to explain what I mean. I feel that as a beginner, there's a lot of cases where I'm inside the stack, let's say that I'm three functions deep, and then I figure out that I need to, to do something that might like return a result. Maybe it's a question mark, 
after an, like accessing a an option, something like that. And to me, it feels that I need to do a lot of things kind of up the chain. I need to change quite a lot of things, like the return values, the way those are handled up the chain. And then I often feel like I'm just kind of going around in circles. I try to fix the problems that the, the compiler gives me, but I don't quite know how to do those. I'm always going up the stack in the code. To me, it feels like I'm introducing more complexity. So I didn't know quite how to, to phrase it, but I wanted to mention it because I think it's, it's something that other people probably struggle with as well. And then the final thing that I absolutely love are the Rastasians. People like you, people in the community who are always open to help. They're open to share. I've gotten so much help from the local Rust community in Finland, in Twitter, on global scale. And having the opportunity to come here today and share the things that I've been learning and struggling with, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's really great. So I'm, I'm really thankful that the community is so open. But it's also that the community is so much fun. I love fairies, the Rastasian, the, the mascot that you've been seeing on the slides. I love the whimsicality of the community. I was just today looking at the Rust Foundation Board of Directors page. And when you hover over the faces, you can see pictures of the mascot that each one of them drew. And they all look a little bit different. And that, that is what the Rust community and the, the Rustasians are for me. So I'm really happy that I found the community and that I found the ecosystem and, and the language. And I'm really happy that I've, I've gotten the opportunity to also share forward the things that I've been learning and the things that, that I've discovered. So a couple of things before the end. I'm writing a blog post series called Learning Rust. It's not a tutorial. It's more about me writing down things as I learn them. I've now written five of them. I publish one on the first Wednesday of each month. And it's been a really great way for me to improve my Rust to learn and to get feedback from the community. So if you're interested in, in reading those and seeing a little bit more about what I've been learning, you can find those on my blog. And the second thing that I think might be of interest, I run a live stream YouTube show called CodePace, which is a developer community show. Each month I invite a guest from a different community, whether it's accessibility, closure, PHP, web components, Python, Rust. I invite different people who know something that I don't. And then for 90 minutes, we talk about technology. We live code something. And my attempt with that is like I mentioned in the beginning, is to give people exposure to languages and technologies that you might not use on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, it's streamed at 5 p.m. Helsinki time, so it's morning in, in Denver, but you can also find them later on YouTube if you don't want to join live. Huge thanks for Brooks for, for giving me the opportunity to join. If you have any questions or comments or want to to participate in the discussion, more than happy to do that. If you want to follow me or find more about me, you can find me on Twitter and on my website. Thanks a lot.
Uh, what's next for your your next project? So you did your um, you did like the hockey score thing. What yeah. what what's like the next level up that you're thinking of uh, taking on with Rust? Yeah. So with the current project, I'm mostly wrapping it up. There's still a couple of bug fixes that I need to do, but kind of design and feature wise, it's done and it's hopefully gonna serve me for the next ten years. Next with me. One of the things that I've been thinking about starting is building a static site generator with Rust. I'm a big fan of SSGs. I've been using a bunch of them. And building my own is something that I would, would like to experiment with. Continuing on the command line tool, experimenting a little bit on, on kind of like what are the design choices that I need to make to make it, it fit my my needs and, and one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately is kind of how to build some kind of a plugin system with Rust. Because with with Python or JavaScript I know how to do it because it's dynamic and it's easy to kind of just execute code as it's running. But then with Rust because it's compiled and it's it's a binary that's something that I'm eager to to figure out on, on kind of how to build like a, a, a core package on the SSG and then provide some kind of interface for, for building custom plugins. That's that's what I'm planning right now to, to do next. Awesome. We've got a few chat questions uh, here in uh, Zoom. Jonathan asks, uh, would something like JSON path help with number one? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know JSON path. I can Google while I, I answer, but I think it it depends a bit because the thing that I've been doing with with the code that I showed is I use Serda JSON for like doing the, the deserialization. And with that, when I get the API response in JSON from the back, from the API, when I have those like, like strong types or, or structs inside the Rust, it automatically maps everything. So then I don't have to kind of do anything, anything manually. Let me quickly see what, what JSON path does. JSON path is, yeah, it's a little bit different use case, I would say. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good, good use case for the thing that you need, that it, it solves. But this one, for this particular use case, it's not really that helpful. And for the, for the kind of generic issue that I have with, with having to name everything as, as types is it's kind of more general thing that just things with with json or with like certain certain values and it's 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 quite a fundamental thing for me and it's it's one of those things that they like references and life lifetimes that's one thing and then the static typing is this one thing those are the things that i i knew when I came to Rust, that, that those are the things that I need to get comfortable with. And maybe one day I will. Maybe one day. Yes, I actually have a, a recommendation for you um, yep. on under, uh, understanding uh, ownership, borrowing, and lifetimes. There's a, uh, a video series called Rust in Motion uh, on the Manning site, and it is um, created by uh, one of the authors of the Rust book, uh, and her husband, or her now husband, I don't think he was her husband at the time they made them, but they they teach those concepts uh, using analogies, which makes them, when I first got started with Rust, it made it so much easier for me to grasp, but they go into great detail on, you know, uh, lifetimes uh, and the 
the fact that those, I mean, lifetimes don't do anything, right? They're just a, they're a signal, so to speak. Uh, but I would highly recommend uh, Rust in Motion for those concepts in particular. It's the best, it's the best resource, best explainer that I have found for those things. Awesome, thanks a lot. Oh, I bookmarked it. Oh, I'll definitely take a look. Uh, let me talk about my experience. Yeah. I struck. I struggled with uh, with a bow checker uh, lifetime for a long time, and I went through the Rust documentation and I read the Rust Emotion book. Uh, I wasn't able to understand. However, when I spent a lot of time on the C plus plus programming language uh, edition four, it's a 1,300 pages a book. And they, there were very elaborate uh, uh, elaboration on lifetime, uh, pass by reference, pass by value. And they touch the, 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 the roots of these uh, computing uh, computer concepts. And after that, I, I came to understand why Rust have certain rules. And uh, that, that's my take. Um, I'm confused by Rust in Motion book because I'm not aware of, of that existing. I know the video series exists, but I don't. there's not a book that I'm aware of called Rust in Motion. Oh yeah, I, 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 it's a slip in my tongue. <laughs> I, it, it was the, it published by Manning's Man, Manning public uh, publication. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I watched the video course, but I didn't uh, get it. Uh, well, that's but, why they make chocolate and vanilla. <laughs> different things be, work for different people. So yeah, my impression is that you know, Rust people have been very nice. They just wanted to keep things simple for 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 beginners however they avoided touching the the the, the roots of, of those concepts until i read the c plus plus programming language that book and i i came understand uh, the the root reasons why hmm. yeah that's interesting um, so yeah, the, the rust in motion definitely is at the conceptual level. Um, and again, they use analogies. So, uh, it's all at like concept level. Um, if you, if you are like looking for, um, what I think helped Jay grasp it is the deep technical understanding. That's nef definitely not going to be part of rust in motion. So yeah, Jay, I agree. You're right about that. Um, I'm actually pretty surprised of how many people I see tend to have problems with like the bar tech in my times. Um, just because my experience was different. <laughs> for for some reason, for me, it it, it, um, it felt very natural. But then again, um, I hadn't been programming for ten or twenty years, so I don't I don't maybe have certain concepts solidified in my head. So maybe that made things easier. Um, the part for me that I found was i don't know if i would say it was difficult to learn but it was like after i learned it i felt like i can actually be productive in rust was learning about the standard library traits um like i signed up for exorcism io like a year ago for the rust track and i got through like two or three and um i just i just really had a hard time connecting things but it wasn't until uh the guy who the, the person that has the rust blog uh pretzel hammer i think is their name on github um they've got one that talks about like learning rust in 2020 i think but then they have one which is very long called uh, uh it's about the standard library traits and that thing cleared so much up for me that i went from like i'm i'm, I, I'm like halfway through the the almost hundred uh, exercises on exorcism and that's that was from like the last week or two 
afterwards. So it was a huge jump for me as far as um, what I was able to do once I got past that. Um, and I think it was because uh, when it comes to the library and the borrow checker, I just, it, for me, it just resembled a thread or a baton, you know, like, and, and all this is, is um, at different points, just remembering where the baton is and who did you give the baton to and did you, did you tell them to give it back? Um, so, so um, yeah, that was just my experience. For me, the standard learning the, the traits and really understanding that and um, how impulse and everything really works. Uh, I felt like that, you know, Red Bull gave me wings. Uh, we have a question on uh, Twitch chat. Fanzy asks, uh, do you, Juhis, see Rust taking over Python, uh, taking over Python of machine learning and visualization due to how performant it is? I don't know. I don't know enough about the, the like data science side of Rust. Um, my kind of guess based on what I know in the Python world I'm a little bit thinking no, because one of the really big benefits of Python is that it's so quick to test things out and I'm kind of build things piece by piece. Uh, a little while ago, this programming language called Julia came out, which was, was kind of touted as something that would, would replace Python as the, the data science kind of de facto because of the performance and because of those things. But it, it still hasn't. Maybe it's still kind of up and coming. But I haven't heard a lot about Julia in, in the past couple of years. I think it, it really depends for this kind of explorator, explorative uh, data science and kind of data visualization and, and stuff like that. I think Python is really good because of its, its speed in terms of, of writing things and getting the response. Uh, Rust is really performant in terms of computer time, but quite often the data scientists end up kind of spending more time figuring out what code to write. And that is really kind of rebel driven in a way. Uh, Jupyter Notebook is a, is a really good example of, of the kind of power of Python in, in that sense. But like I said, I don't know enough about the Rust ecosystem in, in that side to really comment on it. But, but I think that Python, it has such a big community, a lot of packages, a lot of resources, and the, the speed of, of writing Python is, is, is really fast. I hope that answered some part of the question, at least. Yeah, I think Python, one of the things that Python has really done is making it kind of accessible because a lot of data scientists are not software developers. A lot of them only know enough of, of one language to kind of make the, make the things that they need to make. Of course, in data science, it's such a vast field and there's, there's all levels of, of kind of depth when it goes to that. But, but it's kind of, I would say that it's, it's data science first and programming second when it comes to that. So I think that like the, the ease of use of Python has definitely been one of the big, big kind of uh, like driving forces in, in how it's been adopted. Yeah. I think when it, when it comes to, to like, when you need some performance stuff, like you can do, you can do parts of the code with Rust and parts of it with Python. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can check the, the talk by Dom well done that I linked on the slides. So you can kind of take the pieces that need a lot of computer kind of performance and optimization out from the Python and do those in Rust or C or 
all the performance and then do most of it to kind of in the in the like high level like with like like python um awesome Banzi does say thank you for that and it gives him a different perspective If I may, I just wanted to touch on something Jay had mentioned earlier, which was, um, you know, his reading of another language helped him learn more things about Rust. I think that actually holds true for me as well, especially things like pass by value and pass by reference, which both Jay had mentioned. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of truth to that when you're working with languages like C, C++, or my background is mostly Java, and so just learning about Oh, if I pass this object to this other class in a function, how does that actually work in a threaded environment? And Java is just full of pitfalls like that. And I reckon C++ or C probably can be as well. But that's sort of something that helped me understand, oh, OK, this is how things are passed, either on a stack or a heap or via pointer. Um, it just it helps learning other languages as well, I think, honestly. Uh, so I, I just want to say I, I can vouch for what Jay said. Yeah, I think that's a really good comment. Because like, I think in, in essence, the programming languages are just tools to solve problems. And then the things that we can learn from different languages, I kind of the, the, the kind of family tree of programming languages is that they, like, they're always based on something that came before. And understanding the basics is, is definitely super valuable. There's this one project that I want to I want to give a shout out to. I didn't have it on the talk. I'll, I'll link it on chat. It's called Rustlings. And it's a fantastic project for people who want to learn Rust. It basically gives you these interactive like exercises where you get the output of a compiler that's run some code that is, is incorrect and your job is to fix the code and make the compiler pass that is something that i've i've learned a lot through doing things with wrestling so if there's somebody who's who's recently has started learning rust i highly recommend that Uh, I am sharing a video from a previous meetup talk in which it was about machine learning and the U the speaker actually used a Jupyter notebook uh, for Rust with it. It's awesome to see the, the Jupyter like product family being expanded to new languages. I think it's a really great for that kind of like exploration, collaboration, documentation type of thing when you're building a one-off thing. And like, if you haven't used Jupyter ever, I highly recommend taking a look at that as well. Awesome. I think I'm gonna call it a day or night and I'm gonna head to bed. It's half past four, the sun is up. I need to put the blinds on and catch a couple of hours of sleep before work day tomorrow. I'm starting holidays after after the Friday, so one more day to go before before holidays. But thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, Brooks, for having me. Thanks for the great discussion. I learned a bunch of new stuff. And I'll also share the links to the slides in the, the meetup group as well. So it was super nice to to get to know some of you and, and visit visit uh, Colorado area with the with the magic of the internet. With, uh, it's it's great to have you here. Thank you so much, Shuhis, for for staying up super super late for us. Um, and I definitely wish you a good morning. Um, so and with that, every thank you so much for coming by and uh, hanging out with us as we chat a little bit about Rust. Uh, and with that, I will declare it an end, a successful end to the meetup. Um, if you haven't already, follow the meetup channel. And we have another talk next month. 
Um, and in fact, we have talks uh, scheduled through uh, August. Uh, and uh, we'll send out notifications for the, the next one uh, coming up shortly. With that, have a great morning, night, evening, um, wherever you are, and we'll see you next time. Awesome. See you around.